I am actually going to read from this recent book, Spiritual Ecology. I have an essay in here, um, a bunch of people that you know of, Satish Kumar, Jules Cashford, Vandana Shiva, have pieces in here, uh, as well as Thich Nhat Hanh, Joanna Macy, Wendell Berry, Thomas Berry, Brian Swim, and others. So <clears throat> I'm quite pleased to have one of my own pieces in here. So, Imagining Earth. If we approached rivers, mountains, dragonflies, redwoods, and reptiles as if, as if all are alive, intelligent, suffused with soul, imagination, and purpose, what might the world become? Who would we become if we participated intentionally with such an animate earth? Would the world quicken with life if we taught our children and ourselves to sing and celebrate the stories embedded in the body of earth, in the granite bones of mountains and sky tears? What if we apprehended that by nourishing the land and creatures with generous praise and gratitude, with our remembrance or tears, what if we understood that we rejuvenate our own relationship with the wild earth and possibly we revitalize the anima mundi or soul of the world by our own attentions? These are questions I posed to a group of environmental education graduate students dur during a conversation about Aboriginal Australian songlines the stories of totemic ancestral journeys imprinted into the land during the dream time. Traditional belief suggests that singing or dancing the song lines keeps the land alive. I hoped to fire up the students' imaginations with the possibility that even contemporary Western people like us might learn to hear the layered geo-poetry and bio-mythos of the land and its inhabitants and honor them with spoken praise or song or dance, or even, and perhaps most especially, grief for what the wild earth has endured at our hands. Isn't that a little contrived, one of the students asked. It doesn't feel comfortable to talk to trees or to the river. True enough, I agreed. <clears throat> it's difficult for Western adults to even ma imagine, to even imagine that stone or water, forests or creatures have their own ancestral stories, epic journeys and transformations that are not necessarily the stories we tell about them. It's even more difficult, perhaps, for us to imagine engaging with those stories participating with our words, gifts, music, or gestures. But what if, I asked, we simply practiced honoring the wild others as if they could hear us, as if they were responsive, as if Earth depended on this reciprocity for continued flourishing? Well, one of the students allowed, it would be a different world. A sense of the world's numinous, animating dimension, its psyche or soul, its anima mundi, began to recede from the minds of Western people centuries ago. The modern scientific and industrial enterprise is based upon the Cartesian severance of psyche from matter, of spirit from the body. How else would we bear a vivisection, mountaintop removal, rivers poisoned with effluence. <coughs> James Hillman writes of the need for psychology to return psychic depths to the world, without which we have been trying to heal individual human patients without recognizing sentience and suffering in the world in which our individual lives are embedded. It is not clear to me that the world has actually lost its psychic depths, but surely there are few among us who recognize, like Thomas Berry did, 
that the world is saturated in psyche. The world is saturated in psyche. That the, and I'm quoting Thomas, universe, that the universe from the beginning has been a psychic spiritual as well as a physical material reality. The universe from the beginning before us was a psychic spiritual as well as a physical material reality. At dawn in the summer, I carry my flute to the top of the slick rock mesa where I live, where the undulating stone summit overlooks valleys, canyons, distant ridges, and peaks. I play the walnut flute as a way of beginning the day, greeting the world, offering melodies to rocks, clouds, ponderosa, cottonwoods, grasses. I play as if there are listeners. The music is simple, untrained. Sometimes I get lost in the rhythm of my breath, moving through the flute body, emerging as music. And other times I am keenly aware of the others, listening, my companions in the dazzling world. I have been teaching myself this practice of offering small beauty in reciprocity to the world, a practice that has deepened each time I play as if creatures other than human beings might hear me. It is an enormous act of imagination to participate as if even stone hears and plays a part in the land's organs of perception. I began many years ago engaging with the world as if it mattered to the others as well as to me. I began with whispers, with gentle touches, then with praise, poetry, song, actively imagining, intentionally imagining that it does matter to them somehow, even if there's no apparent response. And these offerings brought me more alive, somehow brought me more alive, and perhaps opened some hidden organ of perception in me, because the world in which I am embedded seemed to tremble with greater aliveness, too, like the sudden greening that follows a desert rain. It is one matter to imagine that grass, mountains, moon, willows, warbles, warblers, and weasels are worthy of and receptive to our praise and respectful attitudes. It's another matter entirely to deeply believe this, to apprehend out of our own bodily experience that the creatures and the body of earth itself are aware in some way responsive to us and perhaps they are even participants in human affairs. If, as you grew in awareness of the world, you were taught, as children have been taught in many traditional cultures, if you were taught that the other-than-human world is in conversation with you, asking from you a devoted attention, your experience of the world, your participation would reflect that foundational understanding, we would all be in the world in a totally different way, you would be profoundly attuned to the slightest variations in the habits of birds, the arrival of unfamiliar insects, the emergence of rare rare leaves, the inaudible voice in the forest that says, wait here, you wait, and in a moment, a spotted fawn, or a sow grizzly pads into view. A lifetime of such experience would confirm your unshakable belief in communion with an animate, intelligent world. Even a few such experiences might momentarily soothe the terrible loneliness of living in a meaningless, insentient universe. A practice of honoring the other-than-human world, both embodied and numinous, informs me in my work as a guide to the intertwined mysteries of nature and psyche. Um, 
once I had a man in a short program who had a long history of activism on behalf of wild places, particularly the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. He considered himself deeply informed about the wild earth. I invited my group to wander out on the land for a brief conversation with nature on land that held some of the true dangers of wilderness, opportunities to get lost, large creatures including moose and bears, even though the land is no longer truly wild. And if you wander long enough, you'll encounter a road, a well-worn trail, a river, whose direction will help you locate yourself again. But this man returned from his solo time with wide eyes and a bewildered expression. And he had never before, not once, been alone with no other human being within his range of hearing or vision. He had never before noticed so many phenomena not pointed out to him by a guide or companion. He had never before heard the full symphony of creaking trees, muted wind in the grass, unidentified footfalls. Noticing these things, noticing enough to recognize that he was a novice, a beginner, an initiate, still only a visitor, hardly intimate, hardly fluent in a land whose language he barely understood. This was perhaps his first true act of intimate reciprocity, his first act of offering his deepest attention to an animate earth. On another day, a woman walked into the forest offering spoken praise, praise to moss, to Douglas fir and spruce, to the unknown birds flitting in the branches. She listened and waited, walked slowly on over the pine needles, elk droppings, and low-growing plants. She moved softly, noticing the sunlight slanting through the green canopy, noticing the webs of spiders hanging, noticing the particular cracks and furrows in the skin of the old trees. She pressed her nose against a certain tree caressing the brown bark with bare hands. She stepped into a small clearing and felt her skin prickle, the intelligent rise of hair on the back of her neck. Breathing slowly, she sensed an immense, sentient presence, sensed that she was not only witnessing the inarticulate others, but that she was being witnessed. Another woman had previously walked in the forest with the sense, only with a sense of being alien, an intruder, an unwelcome disturbance. She was quite convinced that she and other people have no natural place amidst the wild. <clears throat> Yet her dreams suggested a longing and perhaps even grief about her distance from wild nature, her own wild nature. <clears throat> and Earth's wild nature. During the day, she walked deeper into an image presented in a dream. <clears throat> she took a path along swampy ground where she covered her hands and face and feet with mud. Whether she intended it or not, the clay secretly did its work, transforming her ordinary edges, blurring the line between the civilized, rational, sensible human being and the primordial self. When, after lingering in the swampy clearing, attentive to the long grasses, the sun, the perimeter of trees, she walked into the forest again, the mud cracking on her skin and drifting into the air as fine dust and she experienced herself as earth emerged from earth. She recognized herself as earth walking. And I'm gonna stop there. And uh, as we're all listening here, and we're uh, the ears of earth listening. <laughs> <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.